I have a first question here for you. How do you find a certified sex therapist in my community? How would I do that? Do I look them up in a phone book? You know, how do I know who's good and who's not? Okay, so um, it's a little bit hard to evaluate who's good or who's not, like with any professional provider. But the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists requires quite a rigorous training for sex therapists. So many of these people are already pretty experienced therapists, per se. And then they get this additional, quite rigorous training, which is both academic and clinical. And the American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists has a website. It's called AASECT. Dot org. And if you go there, there's a map of the United States, and if you click on your state, it will tell you all the certified sex therapists in your state, and uh, then you can find one closer to you. Um, Most of sex therapy is done best in the office, obviously, because you want to be in the office. Some providers will do at least a consultation uh, on Skype. And um, you might be able to get at least some information just from a consultation, but you may just be able to find a therapist right near you, and that's the website to go to. Great. Thank you so much. Here's a more biological question. Somebody has a yellow discharge five years after having a radical cystectomy with an Indiana pouch. And um, you know, how do they? counteract that if they've got this discharge, if you have any suggestions? Yeah, so I mean, many times um, in a normal vaginal environment, we have discharge from time to time. But I would definitely have them address that with their provider just to ensure that there isn't anything infectious going on. Um, there can be other things that can happen in that environment, you know, bacterial vaginosis and, and different things that can happen in that environment that are entirely treatable. Um, I think the primary question, though, is, is something coming down from there that shouldn't be there? <laughs> That's probably what this person is referencing. Um, and, and many times it, it is normal to have a bit of discharge after um, having all of this, but I would still have them talk with their provider and also assess, is there anything else like blood or anything else that's there um, that's concerning? Okay. Great, thank you. Here's another biological question. Does anyone know how long menopausal symptoms will last? I was menopausal for six to seven years before bladder removal, and it's been six years since then. Now for a total of 13 years with hot flashes, mood swings, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> I feel bad for that patient. Um, I'm a little surprised to hear that it's lasted that long, um, but certainly everyone is a bit individualized um, in their ability to experience some of those symptoms. Um, Daniela, do you so have I, any I other? Actually, yeah, I can actually say, you know, menopause lasts very individually. So for some people, it's kind of a blip, and for some people, it's just like a horrifying experience over a long period of time. So anybody who's got these kinds of strong, strong symptoms should be talking to the medical provider like the gynecologist or primary care physician about this because there are ways to try to control symptoms. Sometimes it can help to be on a low dose of an antidepressant. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, there may be other ways, but this is really becomes a medical issue and should be addressed um, directly. And, uh, you know, a person should not just feel like they should endure it and live with it. Okay. Great, thank you for encouraging that patient to go and speak to her doctor about it. I have another question. How long does it typically take to lengthen the vagina, and how often do you need to use the dilator to accomplish this? You know, you did speak about using a dilator to help stretch and lengthen the tissues. You know, what's the usual length of time before, say, penetration could be comfortable or better than it was? Well, I think that that's also kind of individualized per patient. I think it depends on where we're starting. Um, you know, is stuff very atrophied? Is it very narrow? Um, and how much 
um, in a stepwise fashion, is the patient able to even dilate? You know, if it's a slow process in, in moving towards that direction, then obviously it could be longer. Um, certainly we wouldn't want that process to be um, intensely, you know, painful or anything. It should um, be more in the comfortable range. So I, I think that that's kind of patient specific and where are we starting and where is the end goal. Um, I mean, certainly I, we, all, we all want things to happen now, but I think the, the prescription here is tincture of time. Yeah, and I want to just add to that. So I agree with LaShawn that, you, you know, you have to figure out where you're starting. And the thing to do is to go see your gynecologist and find out two things, just how foreshortened the vagina is and then how fragile the vaginal walls are. Uh, that will determine where you start. Dilators start to be very, very narrow and easy to insert at the beginning. And then you gradually go to a wider and wider dilator. And this can take quite a few months. The person, the professional that helps with that the best is a physical therapist who has expertise in this area of working with women. A lot of them are. Physical therapists are fantastic resources for people who had pelvic um, uh, surgery or pelvic radiation or even chemotherapy because what they will understand is not only what needs stretching but also whether there's any scarring tissue that needs massaging uh, whether there are any adhesions that need um, help, and uh, they can be extremely helpful. But it can take a, a few months at least. And uh, it's, it's one of those situations where it's important to continue to be sexually active without penetration to create blood flow and to have regular sexual arousal and not be as focused on the when it's going to happen as on the process of, of getting there. Okay, thank you. So about half of the patients, the, the participants in this program, said that they did have a radical cystectomy when we asked in our poll. So I have a question from a patient who said, if she has to have her bladder removed, what can she say to her doctor to encourage them to keep as much of the vagina intact as possible? I know that you mentioned why they would take out the organs that are nearby and what they typically do during the radical cystectomy for women. But how could she convey this to her physician? Uh, well, when we, yeah, when we see in consult with patients and we're talking about surgery, um, I would just make sure that they're aware. Um, the patient makes their surgeon and the team aware that this is a priority and this is something that they really want to happen because it's an important part of their life and their relationship. Um, and just have that open, frank discussion. And hopefully, um, you know, there's a good rapport back and forth. Um, and that can be established and that importance is established. And then initially, in the post-operative period, um, I don't like for people's expectations to be very high. You know, it's going to take some time. Um, to recover from surgery, and there's a lot of aspects of recovery that we need to focus on, aside from just their ability to um, have sex and retain intimacy afterwards. We're also treating their cancer, um, which is important as well. We want to treat the whole patient um, and everything that they're about. So that includes their cancer, and that also includes their quality of life. So aspects of nutrition um, and a lot of the other things that we focused on as well are really important during that recovery. But I'd say an open, frank discussion with their surgeon, letting them know about the importance of these aspects to their life and quality of life um, are probably the starting point of that conversation. So if I can add to that, you know, when you're discussing having a cystectomy, here are the important uh, body parts to sexual function. Um, ovaries protect, preserve hormones in premenopausal women. And so question whether ovaries can be preserved. Sometimes they can, and depending on the disease, they cannot be. But that's a quite good question to ask. Is it possible to preserve the cervix, which is also important to sexual pleasure? Will the clitoris be preserved? So those are the structures that are very much important to sexual pleasure. And certainly, the, as LaShawn was saying, you know, how for shortened vagina, is that necessary or not? Um, and then we did some research here at the University of Michigan to find out that uh, cystectomy patients tended to focus on sex 
six months after surgery because first I had to deal with the recovery from the surgery, you know, coming to terms with the cancer, as LaShawn was saying, and so on and so forth. So don't rush yourself uh, in, in any way. You can address it a little bit later on, but if your surgeon knows from the beginning that this is an area of your life that's important to you and that you want as much of your functionality protected, they will take care to do it if they possibly can. Obviously, the cancer is going to be their first priority, as, as it will be yours, but they will be sensitive and thoughtful about it, and they'll be willing to address it with you when you're ready to do it after your treatment. Absolutely. Great. Really good information. Thank you. We have time for one last question. It's sort of related to the dilator use, you know, in terms of, I'm sure that an individual would speak specifically to a physical therapist or their sex therapist that they might go if they were seeking this particular type of remedy. But, you know, how often should they be looking to use that dilator? Is it something that they would do on a daily basis, uh, once a week? I mean, what is the typical recommendation for people who are eager to sort of get back that aspect of their life? Probably at least three times a week. You know, it's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing thing, and it has to be consistent because you know the tissues begin to shrink up again if you don't stretch them. So it has to be an ongoing thing, and probably at least three times a week. I would like to thank both Lashawn and Danielle for a wonderful program. This was terrific. Thank you again for everyone joining us for this Patient Insight webinar, and I'm going to say goodbye.